Buon pomeriggio e grazie della vostra presenza ed è un piacere ed un onore per me introdurre questa conferenza. Non è di tutti i giorni ospitare nella nostra sala dei Mappamondi un premio Nobel e poter ascoltare direttamente dalla sua viva voce i risultati delle sue ricerche sulle cellule cerebrali che permettono al nostro cervello di posizionarci ed orientarci nello spazio nonché anche di ricordarcelo, un tassello fondamentale per capire meglio come funzionano alcuni dei nostri processi cognitivi più importanti. Sono sicuro di condividere il pensiero di tutti noi nel ringraziarla, signora Moser, per averci offerto questa opportunità e dopo di lei nel ringraziare anche il nostro socio Pier Giorgio Strata, per avermi informato della sua visita in Italia e per essersi adoperato nel rendere possibile questo suo passaggio a Torino, una città forse un po' austera che mi auguro le faccia una buona impressione e la induca a una visita meno fugace e ad un'altra sosta nella nostra Accademia delle Scienze. Prima di passare la parola per Giorgio Strata, che è ben più competente di me avrà modo di introdurci alle sue scoperte, permettetemi di aggiungere due notazioni della signora Moser che ho letto nel ritratto autobiografico che ella stessa ha scritto in occasione del premio Nobel. La prima è che nell'anno precedente al suo conferimento nel 2014 le è stato conferito un premio singolare, almeno per noi italiani, il premio Madame Beyer Best Female Boss, con la seguente motivazione In recognition of Moser's superb leadership, scientific achievements and her high ethical standards, as well as consistent focus on teamwork and community spirit. Ascoltate tale motivazione, il commento del premio Nobel è stato molto semplice. La verità è che è facile essere un buon boss quando si può lavorare con il meglio, dai migliori talenti accademici con competenze diverse allo straordinario staff sia tecnico sia amministrativo. Ancora nell'autobiografia sono frequenti riferimenti sempre molto amorevoli alle due figlie, Isabel Maria e Eileen Marlene. Nella conclusione si considera che figli e genitori hanno molto viaggiato in ogni parte del mondo e molto imparato, tanto che le figlie si erano presto convinte che tale modo di vivere sempre in viaggio fosse una condizione del tutto, no, del tutto normale. Eileen non aveva ancora compiuto i dieci anni quando chiede ai genitori ma perché non avessero ancora visitato l'isola di Pasqua. Ma la domanda pertinente che, con cui si conclude l'autobiografia sarebbe stata ma perché non abbiamo ancora capito il nostro cervello? Il percorso è lungo, difficile, ma felice. Molti sogni si sono avverati e dobbiamo ringraziare anche Maybrit Moser se, come lei stessa scrive, we have an exciting future in front of us. Lascio ora la parola al professor Strat. Thank you. Ma per intro... devo accendere. Sì, devi accendere. Pronto? Sì. Ma è un piacere introdurre questo argomento che ha un filone continuo che è veramente affascinante. La storia di questo piccolo pezzetto del nostro cervello che ha la forma di un cavalluccio marino, che è l'ippocampo, nel quale le, le, ricerche, le prime ricerche sono originate nel 1900. 57, quando una scienziata canadese, Brenda Milner, analizzò un paziente che era stato operato 
perché era epilettico e rischiava di morire, non c'erano farmaci, l'unica terapia era di rimuovere una cicatrice che irritava questa struttura dell'ippocampo e quindi per la prima volta la Brenda Milner, la brava psicologa, psicofisiologa, ha analizzato in tutti i dettagli, c'è addirittura un libro, ed è il famoso paziente HM, che quando si svegliò sembrava perfettamente normale, soltanto che ricordava tutto il passato ma non è mai stato più in grado di ricordare niente da lì in poi cioè in altre parole era stata distrutta una struttura che era una specie di ufficio smistamento pacchi arrivano i pacchi e li metti a destinazione nella memoria a lungo termine se non c'è quello manca l'ufficio d'ingresso non entra più niente non memorizzi più niente quindi perdi a totale della memoria è quello che succede nell'Alzheimer dove l'ipocampo è un, un bersaglio questo è il primo, diciamo che è il primo, il primo passo. Poi c'è un secondo passo che è stata la dimostrazione di un, un giovane studente, Terry Lemo, lavorava sempre in quell'istituto, quell in, quell in, quell in Norvegia, e si era detto ma se l'ippocampo è importante per la memoria, nelle sinapsi ci deve essere qualcosa che rimane, un segnale che rimane. Questo studente ha provato a fare sotto l'insegnamento di Per Anders, che era il, capo, il capogruppo, ha, ha provato a stimolare ripetitivamente queste sinapsi dell'ippocampo e è riuscito a vedere per qualche minuto che c'era un potenziamento. Dice, ah, questo, però lui ha, messo, ha pubblicato una, dieci righe di un di risultato l'ha messo in un cassetto senza rendersi conto che aveva fatto una grandissima scoperta che poi con Bliss è stata chiamata potenziamento a lungo termine, cioè un potenziamento delle sinapsi che dura. La terza pietra miliare l'hanno fondata i tre che hanno preso il premio Nobel insieme. Il primo era O'Keefe, il quale aveva dimostrato che nell'ippocampo ci sono delle cellule che entrano in attività quando sei in un certo punto, quindi come un GPS, e poi è venuta l'opera grandiosa di, di, di due, eh, di Maybrit e di Edward Moser, i quali hanno completato quest'ultima storia dimostrando che nella parte filogeneticamente più recente e più evoluta dell'ippocampo esistono delle cellule che ci permettono non solo di dire dove sei, ma addirittura di dire se devi andare a destra o devi andare a sinistra. C'è cioè un navigatore. Quindi hanno scoperto un GPS e un navigatore in questa struttura e adesso sentiamo come ce la spiega l'autrice di questa scoperta. Um, this is so nice to be here. Thank you so much for waiting for me. I'm sorry for the technical problems. Um, and thank you for the nice introduction that I understood. Uh, are you sure that, that you can uh, stand that I'm, I'm sitting? Do you hear me? Because I've never given a talk sitting before, but this, this, is, this will be new, new for me. Um, so, I, uh, uh, you heard uh, Professor Strata talking about uh, one of uh, my heroes, Brenda Milner, and um, the topic of today is to talk about memory and also to uh, link memory to our discovery for the Nobel Prize, the grid cells, and to see how memory is connected to space. So if, if you see this connection when we're done with this lecture, I'm sure that you have big hippocampi. Okay, so see, so first I want to uh, show you a beautiful memory that I had um, uh, that I, I want to share. And now I hope that there is some sound. Let's try. So I'm from a tiny island in Norway, and uh, this is uh, childhood memory. So this is episodic memory, memory for events. We have um, uh, a fantastic psychologist who suggested that the way to talk about episodic memory, there are three key questions that you have to uh, answer. Where did the event happen? 
when did it happen and what happened. And what I want you to do now is to join me into the brain, into this deep part of the brain, and then we can check other cells that can help us to answer these questions. If you see the figure up there, uh, uh, it's uh, a human being, and there is a structure there that is the hippocampus. And that is the word I really want you to remember from this lecture. And the reason why it's called, do you hear me when I bend around? Yeah? The reason why it's called the hippocampus is that it's uh, a seahorse, and it's Latin for seahorse, uh, this structure. And this structure here is the real hippocampus that was dissected by Laszlo Ceres from Hungary. And you see how similar they are, and that is why the structure is called hippocampus. If you don't have this hippocampus, like Professor Stratos said, then you don't remember any events in your life. Or at least you can't code new ones. So when Tulvin came with these questions, when, what, where, then he also said that he expected this episodic memory to be only in humans. And of course, we scientists, we love to challenge uh, uh, ideas. And uh, this is a study by Nikki Clayton uh, from the 1990s. And she showed that even a bird can have episodic memory. So how did she show that? She showed it by training these scrub jays to hide food in the lab. And you see here the scrub jay, and you see that the scrub jay can hide the food in different parts here in the, in, in the lab. So since this, uh, this bird was allowed to hide worms and peanuts, he could hide the, or store the peanut for a long time, but he couldn't store the worm for a long time. So that means that this uh, bird had to remember where he put the food, what he put where, and when. Because if he didn't know that he put the worm at this and this time, it would be rotten before he fetched it. And uh, Nicky Clayton could show that this was possible in the bird. So in the rat, which is the species that I'm working on, we also asked the where questions. Are there brain structures that are involved in helping us to know where we are? And uh, we start with uh, one of my supervisors who we got the Nobel Prize together with, John O'Keefe. He did a beautiful study where he just had a rat running in a box and the task of this rat was just to chase chocolate. So uh, John was throwing out chocolate and the rat was running. At the same time, he was recording from the hippocampus of this rat. And then he asked himself, when he was seeing this rat running around, why is this cell active where it's active? So I'm going to play this <coughs> video now. And um, then you can guess for yourself uh, if uh, wh why, why the cell is active. So you should, so I don't hear any sound. So there should be a sound for every red dot that you have here. But, but it's okay, I can be the sound. So whenever you see the rat up there, then poop, 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 silent. 
pop, 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 silent. And you know, when I, got, uh, when I gave my Nobel Prize, yeah, no. when I gave my lecture, then I even had a choir with me to, uh, to Stockholm to, to be the popcorn, give me the popcorn sound. But in any case, one red dot, that is the electrical signal that a cell is sending from one cell to the next cell when there is communication in the brain. So this cell was active in this corner, but it was also very silent in the rest of the box. And this is illustrated here, that when you see the blue, that is no uh, uh, electrical signal at all, and red is signaling very, very high activity. Pop, 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 pop. When John recorded other cells, these cells would be active in different parts of this environment. And other people, Bruce McNaughton and others, recorded um, cells, 100 cells at the same time. Then they could predict where the rat was by just reading the activity of these cells with five centimeters precision. So that's quite amazing. So this is a very, very strong signal, a signature for where the animal is at a certain time. So Edward Mose and me, um, we uh, were trained by John O'Keefe to do these recordings, but we had an, another question. Why are these cells active where they are? So we... Uh, inspected the rat brain, and we knew, as we heard uh, about Tadio Lermo from Professor Strata, that in the hippocampus, so here you see, uh, in fact, this is a, a, a rabbit brain, uh, you see this green structure, uh, that is the hippocampus in the rodent, and if you take out this slice, you see the pathway going then, the signal pathway, with the information going from entorhinal cortex, starting here, and then through this loop. And when John O'Keefe was recording from the hippocampus, he was recording from this structure, CA1, in the hippocampus. So we asked, is this spatial signal, is it generated in this loop in the hippocampus? So how could we address that question in the lab? We just had to make a tiny uh, cut in this pathway. And we were able to do that. And then we recorded in uh, C1, and we asked, do we still see place cells as uh, John O'Keefe? Uh, did. How many of you think that we saw place uh, cells even though we cut this path? There are some people here who believe that uh, that was possible. And that's true. So when we cut the loop in the hippocampus, we could record quite normal place cells as you see here. So here are seven place cells. So this is one environment, one environment, or one cell in, 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 in the environment, and the second, and the third, and so on. And you see that this look completely like a normal place cell. So we knew then that the place signal, the where signal, is not generated within the hippocampus. So we decided to go out. So we went out to the entorhinal cortex and asked, is there a spatial signal in the entorhinal cortex? And if we see that structure, so this is the back of the brain, back of the rat brain, you see this colorful area, and uh, one to most to the, to the right, you see it's called dorsolateral part of the entorhinal cortex. That is the part of entorhinal cortex that give information to hippocampus where John O'Keefe 
uh, discover the place cells. So we decided we will go to this area that give information to the hippocampus and record there. Now I have a, a video uh, that I will play, but there's no sound. So when there is a signal from a cell, there will be a white dot. So for yourself, you can just check what kind of information is this cell bringing. So you see the rat is happily chasing chocolate. And if the rat is not happy, we don't get data. So you see there are already a few dots and it looks very messy. And that is what we heard when uh, other people had recorded in this structure, that it is a very messy structure. There's no spatial information there. But we had happy animals that were uh, loving chocolate and were running quite fast and uh, covered the whole environment. And suddenly, do you see that there is a pattern? And if you don't see the pattern, I can show you uh, the pattern here. So we discovered a pattern that uh, we decided that uh, we called a grid cell. And the reason is, when you see on, on, on this slide, you see the, 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 the black traces, that is the path of the animal, and the blue dots, that is one electrical potential from this cell in entorhinal cortex. What is so amazing with this pattern is that it's so regular. It's so regular that you can tessellate your bathroom with a beautiful mosaic pattern. And you can even fit in equilateral triangles. See that? This is biology. And you don't expect biology to do such, or to make or generate such a perfect pattern, do you? We decided to record um, at different places in the uh, entorhinal cortex, and the more ventral we came, so going from the uh, dark pink down to the blue part here, it was like these grid dots were painted on a balloon and you blew up the balloon and then you saw uh, uh, an expansion like you see here. And we even asked what is the biggest uh, field uh, we could get or the biggest grid cell. And of course then we needed even happier rats because then we had to train the animal on an 18 meter linear track. And the 18 meter linear track was the biggest we could fit in our lab in the corridor. And you see here, the animal is uh, happily running on this uh, linear track. And we could measure fields that were more than three meters wide. So this means that the, the, the more ventral you come in the entorhinal cortex, uh, the more uh, the, 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 the bigger the, the fields will uh, uh, be and the distance. And when you see that the rat is coming now to the end of the linear track, what does it get? Chocolate, of course. Happy. So wh why do I tell you this? Uh, about the grid cells. I want to go back to where we started with the place cell that John O'Keefe discovered. And I will ask them the question, is it possible to create a place field from grid cells? The grid cells, they have all these fields and the place cell has only one field. If you align cells with different scale on top of each other, and you do a simple linear summation, you get one field. Do you see that here? So these are the different grid uh, cells with uh, different spacing, 
sizes, and then you just add them, and then you get one field. If you can remember this until we come uh, further on in the talk, I will be very happy because I'm going to show you this slide once more. It's okay? We wonder also, this grid cell is so deep in the brain, so how can this grid cell know where to be active so perfectly and where to be silent? This cell doesn't have eyes, doesn't have a nose or ears or anything. So it needs to get information about both the way or the, the heading of the animal and also the speed of the animal. Because when the animal is running around, it's stopping and eating chocolate and then it's speeding up again. And uh, we had a fantastic Italian um, a postdoc, Francesca Sargolini, who discovered uh, the head direction signal in entorhinal cortex. The head direction signal had been shown in dorsal presubiculum before, but never in entorhinal cortex. The head direction signal is like a compass signal almost, um, but it doesn't uh, uh, react to the magnetic poles. But, but one cell will be active when the animal is moving to west, another to north, a, a third to east, and so on, like you see on this, uh, this photo. Um, so, so that is the head direction cell. Then, do we have a speedometer in our brain? And then we had a, a postdoc from, who was trained in CISA, uh, here in Italy, but uh, came originally for Patagonia in Argentina. And he designed a car for the animals. And why did he design a car for the animals? Because he wanted to control the speed that the animal was moving. But the rat had to run, and that is why we put up this uh, cartoon of the flint. So the rat was running in a car that was moving. In this way, Emilio could change the rate of the, or the speed of the, the animal, and then he could record cells in the entorhinal cortex and ask, is there um, uh, a connection between uh, the speed of the animal and the activity of the cell? And that is exactly what you see. So if you look here at the left, you see the inbound, or when the animal is running to north, and when the, the animal is running fast, you see the, the, uh, the gray line, hopefully, here. Um, and you see that the rate of the cell is following perfectly the speed of the animal. And also when the animal is uh, going in the other direction. This happens also when the animal is running in the normal open field. And these are 12 uh, box uh, recordings with uh, 12 cells. And you see that there is a linear correlation between the firing rate of the, um, uh, of, of the cell and the speed of the animal. So it seems like we have, at least the rats, they have a speedometer in their brain. And this information is then used by the grid cell so that the grid cell can put the uh, activity uh, in the correct spot. Then we can ask, is it so if the memory is linked to space? Is it so that we have many maps because otherwise, we can have only one single memory. And when we first look at place cells, we can ask, is there so that they have different maps in the place cells? And already in the 80s, uh, Bob Muller and uh, John Kuby suggested that they do have the ability to create different maps in different environments. And even if you change just small things in the environment, you can see uh, a lot of different uh, differences in the firing. There are two types 
of such differences. And uh, one is global remapping, and the other is rate remapping. And global remapping just means that the different cells in room A are active only in room A, and the other cells are active only in room B. For the rate remapping, they keep the same map, but the activity of the cell is changed. And that happens when you have a white box, for example, with white walls and uh, a black box. So this would be um, for, for the bird if, if it had uh, stored a peanut or a worm. Then we can think of the worm box or the peanut box. And here we, um, I could tell you also about attractors, I don't. But we could ask, is it possible to have, uh, or how, how many rats, or how, how many maps can we uh, see in the rat hippocampus uh, in the lab? And we were so lucky that we had 11 different rooms. And they look very similar. Here are the 11 rooms. And we just asked, is it so that even these rooms look so similar, the hippocampus can have different active cells in each room? And that is shown in this figure where we showed that um, blue here in this ma matrix is if the, these different activities in the different rooms are correlated. And you see the red line telling that the only correlation that you have that is high is when you go to the same room. There are some stars there, and that is uh, the, the repeated exposures to, to different rooms. So this idea we used to teleport the rat. And I'm not a big science fiction fan, so I haven't seen much uh, teleportation, but you know this zap, 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 and then you move people to different planets or whatever. But is it so that we can do this experiment in the lab? Do you think so? I wouldn't tell you this if we didn't. So how, how can we teleport rats in the lab? We have to have two environments that can be the scenes of these environments can be switched immediately. And how can we do that? We can do that by using light. So uh, our postdoc, Karel uh, Jesek from um, Prague, he designed this task. This is one environment, and the light is coming from below. Then he trained the animal in another environment where the light is coming from the wall. And he trained the rats so that they developed different maps. That means that in this environment, one set of hippocampal cells were active, and in this environment, another set. And then he could, when the animal was in this environment, he could just switch, use a light switch, and then get this environment. And you know what happened? There was a war between the two different maps. So at only 125 milliseconds, one map was active, and then another 125 milliseconds, another map was active. And then they competed for a few seconds until they decided. Exactly like you experience when you wake up in a hotel room and 
you don't know where you are. Then you think, oh, I'm home. No, I'm, I'm not at home. And then finally you decide. And the reason why it's only 125 milliseconds for those of you who have heard about EG is that this is the theta activity. So it seems like we can teleport animals to an environment from the past and then uh, we can transport them back and forth between the environments. And the reason why I put up this that uh, we can read their mind is that we know which map is active. So then we can ask, is, this, is it the same case for the grid cells? Do they also have so many maps, so many memories that the play cells have? Or is it only one map? And uh, I think it's easier to tell you uh, the answer here, and then we can uh, look at the data, two slides. What happens with the grid cells is that you see that it looks like a, a graphical paper, a mathematical paper. This paper you can bring with you to an environment, but when you go to one environment to the next environment, it is like you can turn it around and shift it. And that is what we see here, but it's exactly the same coordinate system. And that we see here, so here we have uh, examples of uh, a few cells. And to the left you see AA, that is the same environment that is correlated. And the AB, that is the cross-correlation between the two environments. And you see that the dots are shifted to the right. But you see that all the dots, that means all the grid cells are shifted to the right in the other environment. And that is the case uh, with, with any rat, that uh, it's either rotated and also, um, also shifted. So if we go back to this figure, do you remember that you saw this figure earlier today? Okay, so you have a hippocampus, that's good. So if you, if you, if you can now imagine that these grid cells are shifted, the coordinates are shifted in the environment, then you can also see that this place field in the hippocampus has moved. Okay, so this, this is enough about the where question. So we now know that Tulving's where in episodic memory, we have cells in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex that are dealing with these uh, questions. What about the tagging of the time. Because this bird would not fetch the worm at the correct time if there was not a time or a floating time going, giving a tag, telling the bird, this is the time when you uh, stored the, the worm, and this is the time when you stored the, the peanut. So we have this extremely skilled uh, uh, PhD student in the lab who has now moved to Stanford exploring this question. Is there a when signal in the entorhinal cortex? And he explored the lateral entorhinal cortex, giving input to the hippocampus. So how did he explore this when question in the lab? He just trained the animals in boxes that he changed the wall color. So we could call the black box, the, the worm box, uh, the white box, the peanut box. And then he just trained the animals over and over again in these different boxes. And what happened then I can tell you now, and then we can go to the results afterwards, is that it seems like there was a floating time giving tags so that the first white box was differently coded than the second white box and the third white box. And I can show you the results here. 
So if you look to the left first, it looks very messy. I, I'm, I'm sorry for that. But this is just four examples of individual cells. And you see that uh, on the x-axis, that is the time in the black box. And then the white box, and white box, and black box, and black box, and so on. What you see here is that the activity of this cell is starting low when it's in the black box and then increasing. You see that? And then it's falling down when it's going to the white box. So this cell is telling the brain about this is a trial. Now it's soon over. So it's ramping up during a trial. It doesn't care about the color of the box. It doesn't care about the number of boxes. It's just caring about the individual um, time uh, in, in, in one trial. But the next cell is telling something about the whole session. So you see that activity is high first, and then it's getting less and less and less. Do you see that blue line? So these are all the boxes that uh, was, uh, was uh, used. And then the third one, that is the wall um, uh, color trial time. So that means that this signals both that there is a black and white box and uh, the, the time uh, in, uh, in uh, the different boxes, and so on. And if we use then uh, just a, a general uh, linear model, uh, linearized uh, model to, to calculate what factor could tell, um, or, or, or tell mostly about the different uh, variants in the different factors here, it seems like time is what um, what is uh, explaining most of the variance in the lateral entorhinal cortex. In hippocampus, C3, then it's uh, the wall color and position. And in entorhinal cortex, it's just the position. So I know this is very difficult. So now uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm promising that now it will be simpler. Is that OK? I see that you start to get quite tired. So I'm sorry for that. Because now we have the where, we have the when, so then we need some content. So if I should remember something from this lecture, I remember your faces. What content could we have? So the bird had the peanut and the worm. But in the lab with the rats, we can give them toys to remember. So we just call them um, objects. And there are cells responding to objects. So this is a study done by Jim Knierim uh, in his lab. And you see these different objects, and they are distributed in this box, and the animal is running around, and you see these uh, uh, warm colors around the white circles. So there are four objects in each environment, and you see that they're warm uh, colors. That means that the cell is responding to each object. You can even play with it, and the same Albert Sau played with it. He trained the animals on this tower in the box, and then he removed the tower. And then the cell, even though he cleaned the box as much as he could, the cell remembered the position of this tower when Albert removed the tower. And he could move it around in the box. Here, 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 here. And you see that the cell remembered where the, the tower had been. And the last thing I would like to talk about when it comes to objects is that we have now a new type of cell that we haven't published, and we call that an object vector cell. And it just means a cell that is responding to an object in a certain distance and at a, a certain angle. 
So if this is the object, then it would be poop, 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 poop. And even though I turned around, if I had the same angle towards it and I had the same distance, then this cell would be active, as you see in this, um, this slide here. So when there is no object, there is no uh, activity, and when there is an object, you see that there is activity. Um, and um, you can move the object around, and you see that the cell is keeping the same angle uh, of firing and also the same distance. And this uh, uh, different cells, they have different angle preferences and distance preferences. Now I know I go fast, but I, I want to show you this one, that they don't even care about which object it is. So they always respond to the different objects. And that you see here, cell three having the same angle towards the object, which is the white dot here, and the same distance. Um, and this is not so relevant, and uh, this we skip. But what is interesting is that even if you hang up an object, you will see that this uh, cell is responding to, uh, to the, the, the tower and the hanging object in the same way. So it seems like these cells the object vector cells are telling something where you are in uh, relation to an object. And then finally, I see that I have uh, maybe five minutes left. I would like to uh, tell you briefly about uh, one experiment here. Have you, have you heard about Proust? So he had the famous Madeleine cake. And when he was tasting the Madeleine cake, he dipped it in his tea, and he was sent back to his childhood when he met his aunt, aunt and the aunt gave him. So uh, 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 to cite him, the smell and taste of things remained paused a long time like souls, ready to remind us, waiting and hoping for the moment. So it's, it's, it's beautiful. So you know that odors are extremely good retrieval cues. Can we study this in the lab? How would we study Proust's experiment in the lab? We can train Emma to sniff different odors and train her to go to different parts of the environment. So when Emma is sniffing chocolate, she should go to, um, uh, to A, and when she's sniffing banana, she should go to B. Now we can see how well she's doing. Yeah, not too bad. it's allowed to do errors. And for us, it's good that Emma is doing errors because then we can use those errors to understand more what happens in her brain. But now she's concentrating again. See? So she knows this task. And then what uh, the postdoc in the lab, Kay Igarashi, did was to record from the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex at the same time. And he found that over time, and now I'm just telling because I see you are too tired to, to look at more figures. So what he found was that the, uh, uh, an, or the brain was developing maps for the two odors. And when Emma did an error when she went to the wrong place, the map wasn't there. I can show you the figure, but um, so this is the equation, firing rate 
for, for uh, signaling odor A and then minus uh, B and so on, telling that red means that this uh, cell is uh, responding to chocolate and green telling that these cells are responding to um, banana. And then you have uh, 67 cells in a row here. And here is when uh, Emma is uh, sniffing. And this is early in training. And you see that uh, there is almost no red and green. And then later on, it's becoming stronger and stronger, the maps in her brain. But when there is an error, it's empty. And the same thing in the lateral and terminal cortex. What we showed was that this happened first in the lateral and terminal cortex and training um, Emma's uh, memory. So how are our memories, this is two, two last slides, how are our memories retrieved? So now we've learned that in the hippocampus, when you differentiate between different memories or different environments, you have different groups of cells active. So if we now uh, are encoding uh, a memory, for example, for an odor, these are the cells that are active, the green ones. When you then get a tiny sniff of the odor, it looks like this. So you see, you have all, all these cells are active when you encode the memory, but when you retrieve, you have only these three because it's, it's not uh, strong enough, the odor. But because these are connected with LTP, as we heard um, Professor Strata talking about, then the whole ensemble, the whole engram is activated and then poof, you get the memory. And this is shown here. It's very important to understand that memory is not like a film. Memory is a construction. <coughs> so what is this, you think? Giving you a hint, activating a few of your cells. What is it? This? This? <laughs> so, um, I hope that uh, what I've told you is that in the entorhinal cortex and in the hippocampus, we have cells that can tell us where the events happened, when it happened, and what happened. So we know that the hippocampus will use the information that it's receiving from the entorhinal cortex to generate our episodic memory. And then, sorry, uh, just to tell uh, about, so, so you heard the people that were involved and of course, Edward was involved in all of this. Also, the, we get a lot of support from the Research Councils, Kavli Foundation, the Minister of Education, ERC, and so on. And the song that you heard when, um, uh, when I had these waves at the first uh, slide, that was Bartel Johansson, who is the composer, Trondheim soloists uh, were playing, and Torun Savik was um, singing. So then I just have to say thank you for your attention. We thank for this beautiful lecture. And uh, I think this is a, a small structure, which is one of the most detailed uh, where we have, uh, we it has been investigated at the high level of the details that we know in the brain. And uh, I now I wonder if anybody wants to ask questions. 
And just to break the ice, I would like to ask, do, do you think that it is a beautiful achievement on the hippocampus as a GPS and a, a navigator and all this correlation and so on have some, provide some hint on the construction of artificial intelligence of a computer of a, uh, yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, the, I don't think that the brain was uh, evolved to give us these functions. So it might not be the smartest way to make memories. So if you want to, to learn from the brain to make robots, uh, to, so that they can remember, maybe it's not the, the wisest to go to the brain because the, the brain is so much richer. What I do believe is that the brain was evolved uh, so that we were selected um, to, uh, to get children and grandchildren and so on. And then because of our culture, we had some cells that could help us, for example, with spatial navigation, but the culture was progressing so much faster when we developed the memory, and the memory could then be linked to those functions that were already selected for, like spatial navigation. So what I think is that the brain is a super smart organ because it can use uh, functions that were not made for doing what they're doing, but it's just a greedy structure using uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is there. And for example, when it comes to learning to read, then Stanislas Dahen in France uh, has this idea that when you start to read, that is a cultural pressure. And we didn't develop our brains to read. And uh, the evolution is not uh, long enough for, for, for that. So what he is suggesting is that since we already know how to distinguish different objects, we've used this function that we have inherited for, from the monkeys or uh, um, uh, through the evolution, and then using this function to learn to read. And for example, to distinguish between faces, that is part of the brain that you use to read. And then they also show that um, there's a tiny competition between recognizing faces and reading when they do uh, brain imaging. So it's, um, it's interesting, um, but, but for, of course for us scientists, if uh, people working on I, uh, IA, if they could use our ideas to create robots and then do experiments with these robots, then we would learn quite a lot about ourselves, but we might not help the robots to be smarter. They, uh, space memory, a grid, a tune or a loudness, a tune memory. I remember, for example, the beautiful model, uh, novel by Thomas Mann, Herr und Hund, where Bauschan was the name of the, of the dog, was trained to respond to the one quart interval, which is the main theme of Schubert Unfinished Symphony. And I utilized the same tune to uh, train uh, several dogs, and they responded beautifully. And astonishingly, when I did not approach the dog for one year or longer, they still had a precise memory of this tune. Uh, is there something similar 
And you know the problem of absolute hearing, which is rare but still present. So is there an absolute, two questions, is there something similar uh, to your grid system for tunes and is there a persistence uh, kind of memory also for tuned grids? Thank you. Thank you for that brilliant question. So, um, of course, that has been our dream when we discovered a grid cell that this grid pattern is such a beautiful pattern that it might be used for all other kind of functions, like you say, sound. And uh, there is a professor uh, in the States, David Tank, and he did this experiment that you said that uh, the animal had to press a lever and had to recognize one tone, but on the way, he could show that different grid cells were active on the different frequencies. Um, uh, another thing is that I didn't tell you, but of course we have grid cells also. And uh, when people do brain imaging, of course, then it's difficult to see individual grid cells, but uh, there's a group in London uh, uh, who, who are from the family tree of John O'Keefe, so Neil Burgess and Christian Duller, they uh, could show that uh, this sixfold uh, pattern that you see in the grid cell could be discovered also with brain imaging. And what they showed was that, first of all, uh, people who had not yet uh, developed Alzheimer's disease, but had genetic mutations, uh, giving them Alzheimer's disease, uh, these this were people in the 20s, giving them Alzheimer's disease much, much uh, further on when they were in the 50s, they already had problems with the grid cells. That was the first thing. The second thing is that they used this in, uh, that was Tim Behrens, Behrens in, in Oxford. He showed that you can use this grid pattern that they detect then with brain imaging to distinguish different categories of birds. And it's, it's a difficult experiment, so if you want me to explain it, I can, but, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. So then, by just increasing the legs of the, the bird and, uh, and the neck, they had then different x y positions for the, the 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 how the bird looked like, and then they could follow the trace of the the mental thinking when uh, the people had to uh, select the different birds and showed that it followed this hexagonal pattern. So they are then suggesting that you can use the grid cells to differentiate the dif different categories of concepts. So there's a, it's a lot of um, ideas about this. But the problem, of course, is to study something that is not space, because space is so obvious, as I showed you here with the grid cells. But as you said, uh, David Tank with, with sound and then... So I think there's a lot more coming. The question is, there is some genetic basis on the difference between different rates on, on the answer that you show or not? Some genetic basis of difference between the answer of, of what you show in your experiments. I mean, is there is something inherited or not? Oh, okay. Um, for, for example, if the, if the grid cell pattern yes. is innate. Yeah, so we are doing an uh, experiment uh, in Trondheim where animals are raised in spheres so that they don't have these straight walls. And um, it looks like there is, um, uh, between uh, the day when the animal uh, will open the eyes, around day 14, 15, until around 
uh, day 25 after birth, there is a plastic period. And if they are not exposed to straight walls, then the grid pattern is not perfect. But the nice thing is that when these animals are trained in a normal environment, then they get the grid pattern. Io non mi azzardo a porre la questione in inglese perché mi è capitato varie volte in conferenze come questo di sentire la tradu il traduttore simultaneo che invitava il pubblico a usare nel porre la domanda la lingua che meglio conosceva. Eh, vorrei anzitutto eh, ringraziare la professoressa per questa entusiasmante lezione e lo vorrei fare con l'unica parola di norvegese che conosco che è la seguente tac detto questo io faccio <ride> io faccio pratico uno sport che si chiama corsa di orientamento e che consiste nel seguire un percorso su una mappa e scegliendosi il percorso mi piace molto praticare questo sport perché nella vita normale sono completamente privo di senso dell'orientamento. Probabilmente perché il mio ippocampo comincia a essere un po' sgangherato. E quindi, facendo questo sport che la professoressa conosce sicuramente perché è di origine scandinava, io preferisco adottare dei criteri razionali, delle tecniche, degli algoritmi, allineo la, il bordo della, usando la carta e la, la mappa e la bussola allineo il corpo il, il bordo della bussola sulla linea punto di partenza punto di arrivo allineo il corpo della bussola sulle linee nord sud e a questo punto posso anche buttare via la cartina perché l'angolo l'ago della bussola mi indica il percorso e questo è un procedimento razionale e cosciente, che quindi non, non richiede l'ippocampo per ora. Attenzione però, c'è un ma, le cose della natura, come c'è scritto là sopra, sono fortunatamente più complicate della loro rappresentazione su una mappa bidimensionale e quindi questi algoritmi razionali può anche capitare che non funzionino, a me non funzionano, per esempio. No? E quindi a questo punto, quando mi succede di aver perso il contatto con la mappa, cioè di non saper rispondere alla domanda guarda sta mappa e dimmi dove sei, a questo punto devo far ricorso a qualcosa che non è più conscio e razionale e probabilmente sono questi meccanismi. Per cui per esempio se io ho perso il contatto con la mappa ma intuisco di essere al di là di un certo punto a cui dovevo andare perché il procedimento razionale mi diceva 50 metri a nord est e io ne ho fatti 100, mi è successo anche di peggio, a questo punto io devo ricorrere a qualcos'altro che sono queste forme subconsce di memoria per esempio mi rendo conto che di qua sono già passato, in che modo me ne rendo conto non lo so. Quindi per venire alla domanda, che è una domanda da profano, da non accademico, quindi magari anche fuori luogo, che relazione c'è fra eh, diciamo, questi, questi programmi che avvengono nel subconscio grazie a queste celle che lei ha, ha descritto e delle considerazioni puramente razionali, cioè puramente algoritmiche, quali quelle appunto di dire faccio il conto, misuro la, da, dalla scala della mappa, decido quanti metri devi fare, devo fare, io so quanti metri faccio per ogni passo e quindi posso calcolare quanti passi devo fare, eccetera. Quindi ridotto ai minimi termini, che relazione c'è fra un algoritmo razionale e questi procedimenti subconsci che avvengono nei nostri ippocampi. Tac! Um, so this, uh, this uh, was a very interesting uh, question. 
And I think that the way I want to address it is that you're right. Um, you can even not, you, you describe using a map and, uh, uh, and finding your way with a map and compass, but you can also find your way like we did today, having a, a, a guide. And if you have a guide, then what you do then is to concentrate your attention on what the guide is telling, not uh, of the environment you walk in. So that is quite similar to what you say. You have a map, you have a compass, but you don't pay so much attention to where you've been and where you've gone. So my point is, if you are not attentive, it doesn't help you to have grid cells, head direction cells, border cells, whatever, speed cells, because you also need to know something about the environment. You need to anchor these cells to a certain environment. So if you close your eyes, then uh, the only cells that will be active are the grid cells, and they are prone to errors. So they need the environment and the input from the distal landmarks in order to uh, correct for the errors that are accumulating. So it also depends on what you pay attention to. So when you walk in a town, if you see a lot of people moving and you pay attention to them and not to where the sun is, you don't have a compass and you don't pay attention to the name of the streets, you're lost. So you have to know where is north, where is east, where is south. You have to have some distal landmarks that you can trust in order to find your way. It doesn't help to only have these cells. You have to have the memory for where you are. Okay, Professor Mosè, thank you very much for your lecture. I don't know if I am allowed to, to give you my, my question because it's not directly connected with the, this speech, but it's very well connected, in my opinion, with your last uh, paper, which uh, compared uh, of two months ago on uh, proceeding with the National Academy of Science. No? Mm -hmm. And so, which interested me a lot because I am a biochemist. But uh, in any case, I think that I, I will have no possibility to ask this question again <laughs> to you. So if I don't ask now, okay. Yeah. So as far as I understood, uh, not only from this last important and very beautiful paper, the correct function of the entorhinal hippocampal circuit for place and perhaps also time representation is linked to this, uh, let's say, parvalbumin specific expressing oh, yeah. GABA ergic yeah, yeah. neurons. No? Absolutely. Okay. Which is, in my opinion, a very important observation and for me very interesting, of course. Uh, this, these are GABA ergic projection uh, neurons. No? That means, uh, let's say, is my final interpretation of the meaning of this data, that. Uh, uh, that means uh, to an inhibition of GABA-mediated stimulus uh, no? uh, maybe is very important to, so all the phenomenon is mediated by a GABA-dependent uh, uh, neurotransmitter no? in principle. So is it true that the, the impairment of the system in degenerative diseases, for instance, the Alzheimer, let's say, could be caused by a block of a prevalent inhibitory process. Because the, the process that you described very, very well, very interesting, is yeah. in fact an inhibitory process. So the second question is, did you ever use, uh, let's say, drugs with your, with your model, with your animal model? For instance, uh, 
let's say, an excitatory analog of glutamate or a drug which blocks the GABA effect to see the, let's say, the response of the animals. Um, to, to, to see if, if uh, they could navigate, or what was the question? No, so, so thank you for mentioning this study. So um, uh, I even had the video here uh, that is a cartoon video, but I found out that it was too much for this lecture, so I'm sorry for that. But, but the nice thing with it is that uh, it seems like the grid cell is depending on these uh, parvalbumin interneurons that you say. So if you use this new technique that you put in receptors, artificial receptors, into uh, the parvalbumin cells, the Cree, it seems like you, you have read this. If you have a Cree mouse and then you can put these receptors directly into the interneurons of this mouse, and then you can use this uh, CNO, which is an artificial drug that will only affect these receptors, you can block the parvalbumin um, uh, neurons. And what uh, Miao and uh, Chichen showed was that um, then the grid cell was not a grid cell anymore. So the pattern was uh, looking really bad. And the same thing happened with the speed cells. Then they did the same uh, manipulation on mice that had a Cree for the somatostatin interneurons and showed that then another set of cells in the entrinal cortex lost their, uh, uh, their uh, function, but not the grid cells. So it seems like the grid cell, they are bathing in inhibition, and we know that the excitation that the grid cell is receiving is from the hippocampus to bring it out from the inhibition, and also from the head direction system, because we know when we remove the input from the hippocampus, then the grid cell becomes a head direction cell. So it's, uh, and, and also again, with Alzheimer's disease, we know that the grid cells are the first one to die, or this, this area. So it's an extremely important area to study both excitation and inhibition, and metabolism. Anderso, when we recall something from our past, our lived experience, do you think that the mechanisms have something to do with what you illustrated today about the when? That's a very interesting question. So, um, in order to remember uh, what we have experienced before, we can use a lot of retrieval cues. So, one could be odor, another could be time. So, say, if I tell you uh, a certain date, for example, uh, if you got a child at that date, suddenly just that time is a tag that will give you a lot of memories. And there are these people who have these uh, uh, super autobiographical memories. And you can just say, what happened 9th of May uh, 1973? And they can start and tell, oh, I started having breakfast, this thing happened on the television, it was raining that day, and so on. Because they have used time as a very, very strong retrieval cue for sorting their memories and tagging their memories. So I think it's also individual. And also I see some young, younger people here probably reading for exams. And in order to remember um, a lot of information, then you need these retrieval cues and then read a lot of other information in order to have enough retrieval cues. Is there a critical period for developing 
his capacities or you know if you frequently have a, a blind animal or you keep him in a blind environment then it doesn't recover in, when it is in the mature state is that happen also for these maps um, so exactly that experiment i don't know about but um, as i said at least we know that in a restricted environment if they are trained uh, in adulthood then they still develop the grid cells at least um, and i myself uh, when I was a PhD student, I did an experiment where animals were allowed to uh, visit uh, a nursery or an enriched environment four hours a day for 14 days. And I could then show that these rats, they got many more synapses or contact points between their hippocampus cells compared to those cells that lived a very boring life. And these were adult males. So I believe that our brain is very plastic. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you, thank you so much. My question is, uh, if it's possible to read the map, it's possible to, to, to write the map, it's possible to transfer, to induce, one memory about a particular uh, event uh, from uh, one individual to the others. Apologize for my little bit stupid question. Do you understand? I think I, I do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a fascinating question. And you know that people uh, try to develop this chip to put into to the brain in order to increase the memory. You can't bring memories from an, one person to another person by doing this. But what you can do if you get these chips into your brain is to enhance your ability to encode new information. Because when the hippocampus is trying to find cells to allocate, for a certain memory, it, it's not predetermined. It's just choosing randomly. I want these cells to be coding for this environment. I want these cells to code for these, um, these people. And if you remove those cells, you can still encode for these people, but you can't remember. And you can't, you can't take these cells and move to other people and then they will remember what you have learned. That's impossible. Poi c'era ancora una persona. Ah, qui aumentano, aumentano le domande. Ma buon segno, buon segno. Vuol dire che anche il pubblico è abbastanza bravo. So thank you very much for your lecture. So my question is much more time here. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, so the memory is an important concept co-shared by the nervous system and the immune system. So you also introduced very important keywords like what, when, how, are important keywords so you can also find in immunology, but actually we don't have this kind of structure. We have unique cells that actually are doing, especially during the differentiation of memory, are doing, are, are doing something similar to what you are describing today. So do you know if there are some kind of subpopulation in the immune system or some kind of uh, function that you can retrieve from your model and find and apply the immune cells? Thank you. Thank you for that uh, brilliant question. So I would love to learn more uh, immunology because I believe that there is a link, and not only I, but a lot yeah. of other people believe yeah. that yeah. there are the similar functions and similar principles but um, I apologize that I don't know enough about it. What I can say is that um, uh, if, you, if you have an inflammation, it's changing your way uh, or your ability to learn in the brain. So uh, they are also thinking that this could be involved in Alzheimer's disease. But I'm not an expert on this, I'm sorry for that. No, 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 I know 
Allora, vedo c'era ancora una, una, una mano alzata o mi sbaglio? Non c'è più? Non ci sono altre domande? Sembra di no. Allora, io volevo ringraziare la dottoressa che è venuta qui, che ha fatto questa deviazione e mi sembra che valesse la pena. Ringrazio il pubblico che non solo è a corso numeroso e quindi ha permesso di anche dare un po' di importanza alla conferenza e poi volevo anche ringraziare il Presidente perché quando gli ho detto che organizzavamo a Bologna qualcosa e la professoressa era indirizzata là e gli ho chiesto di fare una deviazione lì, il Presidente si è fatto in quattro e quindi diciamo in che otto. tutto in otto e quindi tutto il merito dell'organizzazione che ha avuto successo lo dobbiamo al Professor Alberto Piazza. Grazie.